All right. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> Just to remove the view here. Center values. Okay. Check this data. One, two, three. Okay, great. So let's start uh, the course on chapter two. And this will be the introduction to the legal system. So we'll have the, as I mentioned to you, chapters two and three, the first two chapters, today and uh, Thursday, we'll look at the basics of the law. When we say basics, I mean all knowledge we have in chapters two and three will be used throughout the course because we'll look at the definition of law, source, sources of law, we'll look at the constitution, We'll look at the legal systems available in Canada. Uh, we'll look at the form of government. And then we'll end the chapter today looking at protection of rights and freedoms and also protection from um, discrimination. <clears throat> so we're starting defining law. What is law? Well, in law school, we could define law in several ways. We could define in a historical way, in a philosophical way, but this is not the aim here. The aim here for us is to be straight to the point. So our definition is body of rules. So law for us will be the body of rules. When I say body of rules, I mean several rules. Could be an act, could be a statute, could be a regulation, could be a bylaw. That's why I call it a body of rules, several rules. So body of rules, they are made by the government, could also be made by courts, as we'll see, and they will be enforced by the courts. So when do courts enforce the law? Courts will enforce the law when there's a dispute for them. So if you sue me in court, courts, they will enforce the law for a final decision. You will win or I will win. So law for us is this body of rules that the courts will enforce. But the body of rules also that any governmental agency will enforce. So when I arrived in Canada 2015, almost 10 years ago, I presented documents to the immigration officer. And the immigration officer issued me a work permit. My wife had a study permit at the time. So the immigration officer, the immigration department, they are an example of a governmental agency and they enforce laws. So by looking at my documents, the immigration officer decided to issue me a work permit. So the immigration officer enforced immigration laws and issued me a work permit. Now, almost a month ago, if you lived in Canada for at least six months in a year, last year, you had to file income tax. So CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, they enforce tax law and they withhold money from our pay stubs, but they also demand us to file an income tax every year. So those are examples of governmental agencies enforcing the law. If you're driving and a police officer pulls you over, the police officer is also an example of a governmental agency and they are enforcing the law. They wanna see your driver's license, your insurance papers. Does it make sense? So that's law for us. Law is this body of rules because several types of rules 
as we'll see in the course, and they are enforced either by courts when there's a lawsuit or by governmental agencies. Okay? Now, I'm calling this as body of rules. So in this course, we also have rules. One of the rules is that if you are more than 15 minutes late, you will not get attendance. So it's also a rule. Is this rule law? Yes or no? No. No, it is not. If you said yes, it is law. If you are late, I would need to call the police. Or I would sue you. Right? And that's not the case. So I bring this example just to make it clear to you what law is. Law for us in this course, any rules that will be enforced by courts or governmental agencies, but not the course rule. Okay? Not my home rule. I have a daughter, 15 years old. If she spends more than three hours on screen, she will be grounded. That's a rule. But it's not law, because if this was law, I would sue her or I would call the police, right? So just differentiate that. Now, law and morality, they are not synonymous. Not. Most laws, most laws have good moral value because they are passed by the government, by politicians. Politicians are elected by society, by people. So most, but not all. Give you an example. January last year, if you possessed up to 2.5 grams of cocaine, you wouldn't be prosecuted. Cocaine is still an illegal substance. You may be prosecuted if you have a large amount, but up to 2.5 grams in BC only, you are not prosecuted. That's the law. Some people believe this law has good moral value, addresses the overdoses, crisis, and others, other issues. But other people believe that this is not good law. This makes people consume more. <clears throat> and I would say that even the government now, they want to change this. They don't want this anymore. They have asked the federal government to stop that. So maybe they are thinking this is not good law. But that's law. So. Some, sometimes things are legal, are correct as per the law, but they do not have a good moral value or a good ethical value. Does it make sense? But we have to comply with the law. I could give you another example from the US. Last year, the Supreme Court of the US decided that abortion is not a constitutional right anymore. It used to be, it is not anymore. Some people appreciated this law. Others did not. Well, but that's law. Law now in the US is that abortion is not a constitutional right anymore. Okay, so I'm just trying, I'm not saying uh, I'm in favor of this or that. And it could be, you could also be, but I'm just showing you that Sometimes what is legal not necessarily bring good moral value. Okay, things may be different. Okay, are you following so far? Yes. Okay, great. So let's look at some categories of law, and they are substantive, procedural, also public, and private. So substantive law, and again, we're share, I'm sharing these definitions with you because I'm going to be using this throughout the course. I'm going to be talking about substantive contract law, substantive law in business organizations, etc. So substantive law means rights and rules. So again, when I arrived in Canada, because my wife was a full-time student, substantive law, immigration, law said that I was entitled to a work permit. That's substantive law. Another example, if I'm driving, 
substantive law says that only people with a valid driver's license can drive. That's substantive law. So substantive law is either about our rights or obligations. Substantive law will govern our behavior and also set limits to us. Now we go on a break, and I know I cannot use your laptop because property law says that this laptop belongs to you, not to me. That's substantive law. Are we good? Now, procedural law is how substantive law will be enforced. <clears throat> now, substantive law said that my wife being a full-time student, I was entitled to a work permit. Now, procedural law will determine how I get the work permit. What documents I need to provide? Is there a fee to be paid? Is there a timeline to file documents? So procedural law is about procedure, the steps to experience or to enforce my right or my limitation. Now, let's say some students come to BCAT and they do not take business law because they have already taken business law in a different educational institution. So they can have business law exempted from their program. How do they have business law exempted from their program? Through procedural law. Well, substantive law says that if you have taken business law or a similar course at another educational institution, you can apply for an exemption. Now, how do you apply? What documents you provide? What fee you pay? So this is procedural law. We have to file income tax. When? What information do we provide? So having to file income tax is substantive law. Now, how we file it is procedural law. Are we good? Does it make sense? Now, public and private law. So this distinction here. So public law includes constitutional law. So constitutional law is usually the most important law in a country. Most countries, constitutional law is the most important one. And I say most countries because I don't know the constitution of all countries in the world, but most of them, constitution is the most important law. And because it's the constitution, it's the main law, it's the supreme law. It's the law that determines the government, when the country was formed, etc. And we'll go through constitution. So it's uh, regarded as public law. But public law also involves how the country is governed. Now, all public, all public officers, public officials, prime minister, premier, politicians, police officers, immigration officers, all public officers, they can only act because public law allows them. Public law permits them. Why can a police officer pull me over when I'm driving? Because the law says so. The law allows them to pull me over and check my driver's license and my insurance papers. The law does not allow them to search my car unless I have acted in a suspicious way. Okay? So authorities in general, they can only act if the law authorizes, if the law allows. Now, who works here? Does anyone work? Do you have a deduction in your pay stub? You have a deduction probably for uh, federal tax, provincial tax, employment insurance, CPP. Why does the government get this money deducted from your pay? Because the law allows. Because income, sorry, uh, tax law allows. Okay? So that's public law. Also, our relationship with the government. Well, uh, immigration issues uh, could also be criminal issues. Those are all situations in which we need to interact with the government. 
health issues. So our relationship with the government will be public law. Let me give you some examples here. Constitutional, I mentioned already. Administrative law. So let's say if you want to start a, a new business, you need a business licensing. You have to apply for a business licensing with the municipality. So that's administrative law. Or there's human rights to criminal law, tax law. So those are examples of public law. Public law involves the government or what the government can do and cannot do. That's public law. Now, private. Private law will govern personal, social, business relationships. So I do not use your laptop because of private law. Private law tells me that this laptop belongs to you, not to me. If I looked at your files when you are on a break, it could be a violation of privacy. Private law, you can sue me. You see, there's no government involved here. Can the government not be involved in private law? No, the government may be involved, but the government will be involved in private law only if the government is acting in a private way. When the government wants to buy something, a governmental company, when they want to enter into an agreement, it's okay. But in general, private law is about people at large, companies, private institutions. Examples will be property law. So the laptop example, also in your backyard. If someone enters your backyard without your authorization, this is trespass, you can sue them. You can even use self-defense to expel them from your property. That's private law, the government is not involved. Tort, tort, we look at tort next week. So when we are injured or when we suffer damages, let's say I am mad at you, I take your laptop and I throw on the floor, I caused you damages. You lost $1,000, $2,000. So under tort law, you can see there's no government here, it's you and I. Under tort law, you can sue me to recover that. Contract. Again, the government can be in a contract, but usually it's private parties. You work for a private company. You are in an employment contract, employment agreement. That's private. Okay. So those are the categories of law. Law may be substantive, rights, rules, rights, obligations, or procedural, the steps. Step by step, the procedure, the procedure. Or could be public, government is involved, or private, private institutions, private people. Okay. Are we good so far? Any questions? Any comments? Okay. So let's look at the legal systems now. Most countries in the world, they will have only one legal system, only one. Countries in the world will be either civil law legal system or common law legal system, either one or the other. But Canada has both. Canada has both because of uh, Quebec. So in Quebec for non-criminal matters, non-criminal, Anything else? The system is called civil law legal system. The civil law legal system is based on a civil code. In other words, in a civil law legal system, the law is written and has been codified, is in a code. So judges, they will read the civil code interpret the civil code, and then render a decision. When we look at private law in Quebec, property, tort, contract, we look at the civil code. Do I have a right to do this? Do I have any obligations? I will look at the civil code. It's usually a thick code like this. The Quebec, the civil code from Quebec is, there, is derived from the French 
civil code. In France, the legal system is also civil law legal system. By the way, most European countries, they are civil law legal system. Germany, Belgium, France, Portugal, Spain, most of them are civil law legal system. So the main message here for us, because this is the only slide we'll have about the civil law legal system in the entire course, because this is not the main legal system in Canada. This legal system is present only in Quebec for non-criminal matters. So the main message here is that laws or rules, they are in the civil code. And they are as broad principles and then judges will apply them. Does it make sense? Um, well, let's talk about, I don't know, contract. So uh, when is a contract valid? So there has uh, the parties have to have capacity. Uh, the object needs to be legal. So all those things will be in the civil code. Okay. So how do we know? Substantive and procedural law in a civil law legal system. We look at the civil code because the law is written there. Okay, and then judges, people in general, they will look at the civil code to assess both substantive and procedural law. Does it make sense? Now, common law legal system. This is the main legal system for Canada. Why? Because it is present in everywhere else, all other provinces and territories. And because this course is here in BC, we'll be focusing on common law legal system. Now, common law legal system comes from England. So in England, it's common law legal system. US common law, Canada, the main one. There's also civil law as we just saw. Uh, Australia, South Africa, they are all common law legal system, just to give you an idea. Now, what is the main characteristic of the common law legal system? Well, first of all, it comes from England. And the main characteristic is that decisions, they are the law. They become the law. Not all decisions, but some decisions, and we call this Judge made law. They become law. Some decisions, they become law, not all of them. So that's the main characteristic of a common law legal system. Now, as I have in here, the concept of stare decisis, this is a, a Latin expression, says that judges are required, they have to follow precedent. What is precedent? Precedent is a best decision, best case law. Okay, so in the civil law legal system, judges, they will look at the civil code and will interpret the law that is written in the civil code. Whereas in the common law legal system, they are required to follow some decisions, not all. This will be clear to you next uh, next class, so on Thursday, when we discuss the court hierarchy. Why? Because the stare decisis principle says that <clears throat> the decision of a judge is binding on all judges in lower courts. So we need to know what the higher courts are and the lower courts are, because we know the judges from the lower courts they are required to follow the decision from the higher courts. Okay? So, in Canada, most of private and public law, or most private law action, they come from courts. Court law mostly comes from courts. Contract law mostly comes from courts. So, in Quebec, the law comes from the civil code. In BC, other provinces, 
Supreme Court of Canada, they come from other decisions. This is the same system in the US. And I just told you that last year, the Supreme Court of the US decided that abortion is not a constitutional right anymore. They changed the precedent. It's not common to change precedents, by the way, but they did. They changed the precedent. Now, this new decision from the highest court in the US becomes law. It's law. So from that decision on, no one can come to court in the US and say, hey, I want to go for an abortion uh, based on constitutional law, on, on abortion as a constitutional right, because the law is now different. Right? Judges are required to follow that law. Yes. Yeah, so what the decision says is abortion is not a constitutional right anymore. In other words, states, they can pass law as they wish. So yes, some states have allowed abortion. And that's right, because the, the Supreme Court of uh, US said it's not on the Constitution. So it's now the business of states. If states want to allow, it's their business. If states want to prohibit, it's also their business. So yes, now it's a state law. OK? Uh, so. That's the main uh, characteristic of stereocytes. In Canada, we have a famous decision. And by the way, because of uh, common law, I have to read decisions weekly, on a weekly basis. I need to update myself. Why? Because new decisions are rendered on a weekly basis, eventually daily basis. And some of them, not all, but some of them, they become law. They are precedent. So the decision about 10 years ago, a little more 10 years ago, same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage in Canada is legal. Where is it written? It's not written in the law. It is Supreme Court of Canada decision. Okay. Now, as I said before, if you agree with this or if you disagree, this is not the discussion here. And again, you may agree, you may disagree, it's fine, but it's law. It's law in Canada that same-sex marriage is legal because it was decided by the Supreme Court of Canada. Okay? So that's common law. And because we know through cases what the rights and obligations are, they may predict, parties may predict the outcome of the litigation. So while in civil law, judges, they will interpret the civil code, and when they interpret the civil code, we don't know how they will interpret. They may interpret this side or that side. Now, in common law, we already know what the decision may be. Now, if there's a dispute, let's say uh, uh, two, two uh, people from, uh, two, two persons from the same sex, they try to get married, let's say in Alberta, and they are not allowed to get married because same sex. So they seek a lawyer and the lawyer will say, well, we should sue. We should sue the register uh, department because according to case law, same sex marriage is legal in Canada. In other words, in a common law system, it's easier, not guaranteed, but it's easier to know what the outcome of the litigation may be. But there's never a guarantee. There's never a guarantee. And now, judges, they will follow decisions, past decisions, as long as the facts of the current case are the same as the previous case. If the facts are different, then there may be a new decision, a different decision. Are you following? <clears throat> okay, so because of common law, and because common law is the most important legal system for us in Canada, so your main assignment for this course is to search a case law, to write a report on that case law, and to present it to everyone else. 
okay, uh, based on the legal system, common law, that is very important for us. So in Canada, both legal systems, they coexist, but it's not common uh, everywhere in the world. I'm not so familiar with, but I heard from an Indian lawyer once that there's also a, a kind of a mix civil law and common law in India too. But I'm, I'm not familiar about the Indian legal system, but I heard something about that. Now in Brazil, the country I come from, we're only one legal system. There's only civil law legal system there. So in Brazil, we have a thick civil code. Our civil code in Brazil does not derive from the French one. Ours derive from the German one. Okay, so it was the decision of Brazil back in the early 20th century. All right, we also have equity. What is equity? Why is equity important? Well, equity is important because we still have the law of equity present in our legal system today. When did equity uh, came into existence? Well, because, let's, uh, let's uh, try to think together here. So, if the common law started in England back in the uh, 17th or 18th uh, century, and then I'm telling you that Decisions are binding on judges on lower courts. Means that judges, they cannot render different decisions if they want. Because they are required to follow a precedent if the facts are similar. Now, there were some circumstances back then which uh, decision from common law would not render the best remedy for the parties. So if I cause you damage, you sue me for money. But what if I keep on causing you damages? Every class, I cause you damages. On top of money, you also want me to stop causing you damages. So you also want a stop order. You want the judge to order me to stop doing what I'm doing. That's an example. In common law, most of the remedies available would be money compensation so the king at that time created what was called the court of chancery but this court doesn't exist anymore if it doesn't exist anymore why why are we talking about them because the remedies they created the law they created still exists so the law of equity comes from the court of chancery even though the court of chancery doesn't exist anymore because it merged with the common law courts we still have the law of equity. And the law of equity allowed and still allows some flexibility in the decisions. Okay, so when we talk about torts, when we talk about contract law, I will be sharing with you some equitable remedies. And when I talk about equitable remedies, you would remember that they were created in the court of chancery but this court doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so I'm just giving you the historical background, but you don't need to um, memorize that this court once existed, it merged, etc. No, just remember that they created the law of equity and the law of equity is still present with us. Now, I told you that the main characteristic of common law system is about Precedence is about judge made law, it's about past decisions. But in common law, there's also written law. Why there's written law? Well, there's written law because courts, they did not render decisions as fast as society evolved. So society evolved faster than courts could present laws. Because of this, politicians, they also make law. And the law that politicians make is called statute. Have you ever heard of the statute? Have you ever heard of statute law before? So a statute is the law that comes from parliament. Parliament in the federal government, federal level, in that is based in Ottawa, but could also be the provincial assembly. 
will also be statute. So statutes are also part of the common law system, and we'll look at statutes in detail a little later, but for now, we should know this concept that is called parliamentary supremacy. Parliamentary supremacy is that says that if statute law, law passed by the politicians, if they conflict with case law, there's conflict, statute law will prevail. Statute law will overrule. That's what parliamentary supremacy says. Why is this? Try to understand. Judges, they are appointed by the government. It could be the judges were biased. Now, politicians are elected by the people. Politicians have to vote, and the majority will approve a new law or not. So that's why the Constitution of Canada made parliamentary supremacy. Uh, they have made a uh, statute stronger than this one. In practical uh, words, what does this mean? It means that, let's say, um, okay, this this would be against the charter. Uh, okay, but I'm going to get the U.S. example. So the Supreme Court of uh, U.S. decided that abortion is not a constitutional right. Could be that the U.S. Parliament they would pass law, they would change the constitution. And they would add abortion as a right. If this is the case, it means that the Constitution would conflict with case law. But the Constitution prevails. So written law passed by the Parliament, by politicians, they will prevail over case law when they conflict. Okay, This is based on parliamentary supremacy. And that's important concept. Now, throughout the lectures, we're going to practice some uh, multiple choice questions. So this is the first one for you to practice. So think about it. If this uh, were in an exam or a quiz, which one is the, the right one? Okay, I read, C, I heard C. Let me give you some more time to think about it. Do you agree, C? Do you have a different one? No, C? So we're saying that the definition of law or the most usable for us is law in terms of what courts and other government bodies will enforce. That's correct. So this is an example of a question you may find in your quizzes and exams. Um, I should not lie, and well, I should be honest with you. In the exam, questions are slightly more difficult than this ones. Okay, but still, uh, I'm showing you uh, similar questions. Now let's move on. Talking about the Constitution of Canada now. Well, <laughs> Canada was formed as a country back in 1867. Why? because there was the British North America Act. That act created Canada in 1867. But we don't refer to that act as the BNA anymore. We refer to that act as the Constitution Act of 1867. So the law that created Canada as Canada is nowadays, like a country with provinces and territories, is the Constitution Act of 1867. The Constitution Act of 1867 also brought to Canada the concept of rule of law. The rule of law says that everyone is subject to the law. The law has to be applied to everyone equally. And eventually you may think, well, this is beautiful in theory, but it doesn't happen in practice. Well. It's not my intention here to tell you that the law makes the world perfect. No, it's just the law as it is. And I would say 
and you may disagree. I know there are uh, Brazilians in the classroom, but I would say in my country, it seems that the law doesn't apply for some people. So powerful they are, so rich they are, so whatever they are. So theory, it's not always what we see in practice. But the rule of law is an important concept in most democracies in the world. Regardless of how powerful you are. So Trudeau, the premier of BC, the richest person in Canada, the law has to be applicable to them as it is applicable to me, to you, to all of us. That's the rule of law. Okay? That's an important concept, but again, keep in mind, theory is not always um, not always uh, that beautiful in practice. It also, uh, the rule of law also says that we are protected from abuses from the government. Again, mostly in theory. We do see some in practice. Abuses from the government, for, for example, if a police officer pulls me over, they want to see my driver's license, my insurance papers, it's fine, they can do that. And then they want to search my backpack. They believe I have drugs or explosives or gun or I don't know. If they search without a warrant, judge's order, is this arbitrary? They are abusing all their rights. Okay, so why can I say that? Because of the principle of rule of law. Only a judge can allow search, for example. Now, so two things, two aspects that make the Constitution Act of 1867 important. First, created Canada as a country back in 1867. Second, brought the rule of law to um, to the uh, government of Canada or to the country. Another thing is, and I'll go back to that slide. The third aspect that the Constitution Act of 1867 is important is sections 91 and 92. You don't need to memorize the number of sections. You just need to understand what they mean. They mean that powers between the federal and provincial government was divided. So when Canada was created back in 1867, sections 91 and 92 said that some matters, some topics are of exclusive jurisdiction, exclusive power of the federal government, like criminal law. Only the federal government can pass criminal law in Canada. When I arrived in Canada, Trudeau was about to be elected, and Trudeau had promised to change the criminal code in a way that possession of up to 30 grams of marijuana wouldn't be a criminal offense anymore. Only Trudeau, only the federal government could promise that, because only the federal government can pass criminal law. That's why the current law in BC, so up to 2.5 uh, 2 grams of cocaine is still a criminal offense, but you will not be prosecuted. This was not a change in the law. This was only an authorization from the federal government to the provincial government. The federal government had to authorize this in BC because they have exclusive power in criminal law. Let's say the Burnaby uh, mayor, they pass law, by law. They say that, the bylaw says that if students miss more than two business law lectures, they are subject to 10 days in prison. Let's say you miss two lectures and I report you to the police. They come and arrest you. What's your best defense? Enterprise. And guys, no, but you're arrested now. You're arrested. What's your best defense? Was the federal government that made this law? No, it was the municipality. So your best defense is that this law is illegal. 
Does it make sense? The law has to be made by the federal government only, criminal law, and all other all other topics. Now, there are other topics that are exclusive jurisdiction of the province, such as municipal institutions. So provinces, they can create as many cities as they want, many municipalities as they want. It's the provincial power. Maybe the federal government is not happy. They say, they uh, say to uh, the provincial government, hey, why do you create so many cities? Stop creating cities. The provincial premier would say, hey, look at the constitution, sex, section 92. I can create as many municipalities as I want. It's under my exclusive jurisdiction. Can you understand this? So the federal government has exclusive power on those matters. And the provincial in these matters. You don't need to memorize all those matters, but you need to understand how this division of power works. Because when you are listening to the news, you are reading the news, you understand why provincial and federal government are discussing about a certain issue. And then you know who has power to do what. Okay. So now another Constitution Act that is important is the Constitution Act of 1982. Uh, 42 years old. So this Constitution Act is important, first of all, because it brought the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to Canada. So we'll look at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms later on, but uh, briefly or in a nutshell, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects us from abuses from the government. So that's why we have freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, freedom of religion, uh, democratic rights, mobility rights, language rights, etc. So we are all protected of these through the Charter. Now, a second aspect of this, uh, a second important aspect of this Constitution Act of 1982 is that from 1982 on, Canada became fully independent from the British. So since 1982, if Canadians want to change their form of government, if they want to change the constitution, they can do that. They don't need approval from the British anymore. Yes, Canada is still part of the Commonwealth. It means that the head of state is still the king, used to be the queen, now it's the king, King Charles, represented in Canada by the governor general. But still, we can change anything we want because we don't need the British approval anymore. Now, Canadian Constitution is then formed by the Constitution Act of 19, uh, 1867 and the Constitution Act of 1982. And the Constitution has three elements, statutes. So statutes, written law, law passed by parliament, passed by politician, they are part of the law. Case law, that's why we are common law, because it recognizes case law, and also conventions. Conventions can be uh, written law, uh, unwritten law, could be customs uh, that may be applied in cases. <clears throat> so we talked about this. Okay, now this part. The Constitution, while dividing powers, they also divided the making law power. So who makes law? In three branches or three powers. So the government of Canada or Canada as a country has the legislative branch. When I say branch, I could also say power. I could also say department if I wanted. But technically we say branch. So the legislative branch, who are they? They are the parliament at the federal level or the provincially the, the provincial legislature. They are the legislative branch. What do they do? They make law, they make statute law, legislation. We have the judicial branch. What is the judicial branch? They are the courts. 
The courts are the judicial branch. What kind of law do they make? Case law, decisions, because some of their decisions, they become precedent. And then we have the executive branch. Who is the executive branch? The, the prime minister and the cabinet in the federal level, and the premier and their cabinet in the provincial level. What, what kind of law do they make? Well, first of all, they implement the law that is created by the legislative branch, and they make bylaws, they make regulations. So all those branches of government, theoretically, they work in harmony with one another. Because each one has its respective role, different role. Politicians, they need to make law, right? They need to make law. So they pass new law, they change the current law, they add new law. The executive, they manage the country, they run the country. How do they run the country? They run the country by applying the law. Because as I told you initially, because of public law, governmental officials, they can only act if the law allows. So the law allows them to manage and run the country. And the courts, what do they do? They settle disputes. They settle disputes between private individuals, between the government and individuals. They settle disputes. No branch is more important than the other. They each have their own role in the system of government of Canada. So the legislative uh, branch based on the sections 9192. Is that right to say? Uh, yes, it is. So when they are making law, the legislative branch will only make law for those topics. And the legislative branches of the province, they will make law for this. Yes, uh, these topics. But because they also make regulations and other laws. So sections 91 and 92 also apply to the executive branch. Okay, so this is important. And then here you have examples. Examples of laws by the federal, laws by the provincial legislative, laws by the executive uh, branch. So usually you have an act, act, comes from the legislative. Act, 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 act. Regulations, regulations. By law, regulation, regulation. The laws they make, they are either regulations or bylaws. Those regulations or bylaws, they are dependent on this act. The acts, they have the main law. The regulations, they have the detailed law. So we have the Income Tax Act, and we have several income tax regulations. The income tax regulations, they detail the Income Tax Act. The Income Tax Act is more difficult to be changed because it has to be voted, approved, the regulation is easy to be changed because the executive, the prime minister, and their cabinet, they can just change if they want. No voting is required. And then you have the laws that are made by the judicial branch, the courts. They are case law. So is the legislation kind of the umbrella, the voting? No, no. They are independent from one another. Okay, so they are part of the government. No branch is more important than the other because they each have their respective role. Okay, but we in Canada, we, we don't vote for prime minister and premier. We vote for members of parliament. 
or members of the Legislative Assembly. They, by majority, will elect the Prime Minister and Premier. So that's why the legislative branch, they make the main law. Because they, theoretically, they are the voice of society. The executive branch, not necessarily. Okay? And then the courts, the judges, they are appointed by the executive. So the executive, they appoint judges. But it's not because the executive branch appoints the judges that judges will decide in favor of the government. No. Judges, once appointed, they are free to decide as per the law and legal principles. Okay. So this is an example of the legal system in Canada. Laws that we refer to. So some laws, they come from the legislative, others from executive, others from judicial. Some laws come from the provincial, others exec, uh, federal branch. We need to be able to understand this difference and navigate through this. Okay, delegation of powers. Well, delegating powers is prohibited. In other words, the federal government, they cannot delegate the criminal law to the provincial government. No, they can't. Criminal law, only federal government. By the way, if you know about the legal system in the US, or just an example, criminal law in the US is not federal, it's a state law. That's why in some states in the US, there's capital punishment. In some states, you can carry a gun like in Texas, where you can carry a gun, even in the classroom, I wouldn't make any jokes in the classroom because they can carry guns. So it's state law. In Canada, it's different, it's federal, just to give you an example. Okay, so this delegation is prohibited. All right, let's break 10 minutes and uh, we'll be back.